Welcome back to part two of our lecture on anxiety and anxiety disorders. In part two, we're going to talk about panic disorder and agoraphobia. Before we can talk about panic disorder, we have to first understand what a panic attack is. Because to qualify for panic disorder, you first have to figure out whether or not the person has had panic attacks. Panic attacks are something that's actually quite common. Over 12% of the population will have at least one panic attack over the course of their life. But thankfully, despite most people having had a panic attack, most people do not go on to have panic disorder. But first, what is a panic attack? They're characterized by a very, very sudden, intense fear, discomfort that goes from no experience at all to having all these symptoms within 10 minutes. And it has to have at least four symptoms, but if you've ever known someone to have a panic attack, you'll know that most of them report having many, many more than just four. It could be pounding heart and palpitations, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath, feeling like they're smothering, feeling like they're choking, pain in their chest, feeling nauseous, having their stomach cramp up in, in pain, feel like they, they're going to die, lightheadedness, dizziness, hot sweats, chills, numbing and tingling sensations in their fingertips, feeling disconnected from their body or like the world is not real, feel that they're going crazy out of nowhere. Now to put this in context, imagine whatever you're doing right now if out of nowhere, all of a sudden, within seconds, you go from being fine to suddenly shaking, sweating, your heart is racing, you feel like you're going to pass out, you're, you're, you have chills, and you think that you're about to die. It goes from nothing to everything all at once. And to count as a panic attack, it has to go from zero to the worst point within 10 minutes. Now, although it can take 10, it has to take what happened within 10 minutes, it can take easily more than 10 minutes to recover. And part of the thinking about the panic attack is that it's a normal terror response but it's being triggered at the wrong time. It's being triggered without there being any reason for a terror response. You'll see that in our Dropbox folder, I'm sorry, in our D2L folder, you have some videos to watch and I'm gonna encourage you to take a minute and watch the videos. The first one is from the movie Copycat and shows the main character seeing pictures, and then going into a full-blown panic attack. Remember I said you must have had panic attacks before you can qualify for panic disorder. To qualify for panic disorder, an individual has to have had recurrent, unexpected panic attacks meaning that there's been at least two that had no obvious cue or no trigger. They occurred completely out of the blue. And we say that for the first two because people may come to recognize what that trigger is after they've had two or three. So we wanna know that at some point they came out of the blue, they didn't have anything that they thought might trigger them even if they do come to recognize triggers now. The panic attacks cannot be explicitly precipitated by feeling afraid, having stress, or being really worried. They can develop situationally predisposed attacks. For example, whenever they're in a crowd, they will now have panic attacks and maybe the first few happen out of the blue, but now anytime they're in that situation, they end up having panic attacks. And people are more likely to have a panic attack where they've had a past panic attack. So an uncued panic attack in the store could actually predispose someone to having a panic attack in the store again. 
And the second part of diagnosing panic disorder is looking at how the individual is responding to a panic attack and then determining if that diagnosis of panic disorder applies. So at least one month after their panic attack, they continue having these symptoms, either a persistent concern or worry over having an additional panic attack or worrying about it, the consequences of the panic attack. And here we mean people might come to fear that they're going crazy, that they're gonna have a heart attack or that they're losing control. And just to be clear, it would be normal to have some of those fears right after or during a panic attack. But here we're saying it's now been a full month and you still are thinking about it all the time and worrying that the panic attack that you had a month ago could mean that you're going crazy or losing control or gonna have a heart attack. And we'd also look at significant maladaptive changes in behaviors related to having panic attacks, such as trying to avoid them, um, trying not to go places where you think you might have one, or trying to avoid situations that might prompt one or exercise because of the sensation in, in their heart. Here we see the cognitive model of panic disorder. It shows the cycle of heightening anxiety that can lead to a full-blown panic attack and also shows us that there are both cognitive and physical factors associated with panic disorder. We would start at the very top and say that there's something that has triggered the panic attack. And this can be something internal to them or external. But we would now go back even further and add panic proneness as being the very first step in this model, even before there's a triggering event. Our proneness to panic may be a genetic predisposition that makes us overly sensitive to anxiety, such as perhaps having an overly excitable amygdala. It could also refer to having inadequate levels of a neurotransmitter GABA, which would typically reduce the CNS activity that would then reduce stress. So first we have panic proneness even before the, the triggering event, and then something triggers the anxiety. This could be an internal bodily sensation or an external threatening cue. Then we might have that sense of, oh, my chest is tightening. And we then attack a threat, attach a threat to the trigger. Oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack. This heightens our anxiety and our apprehension, which the body then reacts to in a bunch of different ways. It could increase our heartbeat, our, our heart rate, start sweating, breathing faster. And these sensations lead to even more catastrophic thinking and more catastrophic interpretations of what those physical sensations mean. I'm gonna die, help me, something bad's happening, I'm about to die. This then furthers the feelings of threat and increases the anxiety even more. This loops together in a vicious cycle that then results in a full-blown panic attack and full-blown panic disorder. The worldwide 12-month prevalence is only 0.1% to 0.8%, so less than 1%. But the interesting thing is the U.S. has far higher rates than the rest of the world. The 12-month prevalence in the U.S. is 2 to 3 percent, so that's three times the highest estimate for the rest of the world. And the lifetime rates are 5 percent. In children under 14 years old, the rate is at roughly half a percent or 0.4 percent. It increases following puberty and then peaks in adulthood. And then by older adulthood, it goes down to 0.7%, less than 1%. We know that clinically, it looks very similar for men and women, but women tend to have higher rates of panic disorder than do men. 
you may have caught me referencing a couple of times people with panic attacks and panic disorder developing concerns about going out of their houses or being in certain situations. And that is something that we call agoraphobia. And we talk about it together with panic disorder because there's such a high comorbidity between panic disorder and agoraphobia. But let's talk a little bit first about what it is. A marked fear or anxiety about having two or more situations or locations. So to say that more clearly, individuals who have agoraphobia first must demonstrate that they have fear and anxiety about at least two of these areas, using public transportation, being in open spaces, being in enclosed spaces, standing in line or being in a crowd, or being outside of the home by themselves. These individuals have these fears and continue to avoid these places because they're having thoughts that they might not be able to escape or that escape could be hard or if they need help that help will be unavailable if they start to have a panic attack they may be afraid that they'll become incapacitated or that they might have something really embarrassing happen like falling having incontinence having a panic attack so to make these links really clear, they have fears that something bad would happen. And those fears then change how they can engage with the world. These thoughts that they have, thoughts that they won't be able to escape, that they'll have something embarrassing happening and won't be able to get away or that they won't have help that they desperate need, it starts to change how they feel about certain situations. And those situations now will provoke terror responses, this fear and anxiety response, or they now actively avoid those spaces. Or if they go into those spaces, they have a trusted companion who, who can go with them because they feel secure that that person will be able to protect them or help them if they begin to have a panic attack or they manage to go into those spaces, but they are doing so with intense fear and intense anxiety, and it's horribly painful for them to, to go in ahead and do those things. Importantly, the fear or the anxiety they're experiencing is out of proportion to the actual danger that they're in. And for them to have a diagnosis of agoraphobia, we would want to make sure that their fears are not confined to a specific phobia or a social phobia, those have different diagnoses, that it's not confined to simply having obsessive thoughts or beliefs about their appearance being flawed. Again, those will be different diagnoses. We also want to make sure that this is not a PTSD or trauma response that we're mislabeling as agoraphobia and that it's not merely a fear of separation, particularly with children. The world 12 month prevalence is similar to panic disorder in that the highest estimate is less than 1%. And the US 12 month prevalence is 1.7%. So again, it's still double. And the lifetime rate is just under 2%. We know that women tend to have higher rates of agoraphobia than do men, but men and women both get it and it looks similarly. The mean age of onset is around 17. If people have no history of panic attacks, it's more likely to be 25 to 29. And we know that it's very, very rare in early childhood and it's very rare to first develop after age 40. Individuals who develop agoraphobia tend to remain symptomatic and chronic. So for a very long time, it will continue and it will continue kind of across all situations and across all experiences. If people do not have treatment, it is very unlikely that they will get better. Remission is extremely rare without treatment. And many of the cases 
will also have panic disorder. We know 30 to 50% of cases will have panic disorder as well.